recording in progress. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited today because I somehow convinced the great Marco Romero to come talk to us. And I have to be honest, this is actually mostly me wanting to get some more information out of Marco because I've been fortunate enough to know him for, I, I said earlier today, like maybe five or six years. I don't know really know how long we've known each other, but it's been quite a while. And I know that you've had uh, you've been doing investing for even longer than that, because I remember the first time I ever saw a picture of you, the first time I ever heard your name, uh, there was an eight by 10 on Eric's desk of you and a bunch of other people sitting in a room. I want to say Dave Rose was in there, Mike Arge, like all those, oh, yeah, and he I was pointing that. out, he was pointing out all the people. And I'm like, and that's from the first time I heard Margo and that picture had to have been five years old at that time. So I know you've been doing investing for what better part of 10 years, maybe longer. 2009 is when I started. And 2009 is when you started. So I know one of the great things about working at Whiteline, because this is a, is a Whiteline thing, is we are one of the few brokerages that allow and actually encourage our agents to do investing. Um, and we even allow wholesaling, thanks to a lot in part with your wife and what she's been able to help us, what we've gleaned from y'all uh, in that situation. But so in 2009, you got started and a lot of people ask me how to get started and I have my opinions, but I want to know how you got started. Where, where did the, what were you doing in 2008? Let's start there. Well, um, so what kind of started on my journey actually was when I read rich dad, poor dad in high school that put me on the trajectory of like, Hey, I want to become an investor. I want to become a businessman. And once I read that book, I started taking jobs to build skill sets that I knew that I needed to have um, to eventually hit my goal. So I'm more of an introverted person. I'm not as extroverted, though I now can turn on the extroversion part of me. Um, but at the time, I was more comfortable in front of a computer by myself doing my own thing. And so I took jobs to work on that. So my first job was selling knives with Cutco. There's some pretty cool people that have been in that business. And uh, eventually I went to a, a call job because I wasn't very good on the phone. So I wanted to work on my phone skills. And then eventually I became a server and I ended up at Papado. And eventually I became a bartender and a manager uh, at Papado. And I very much enjoyed the job. Simultaneously, while I was taking all of these uh, jobs, I was reading a ton of books, a lot from Robert Kiyosaki, but from many other authors as well. And I was also attending numerous different seminars. I eventually joined, uh, or I went to a seminar at Lifestyles Unlimited. It was their first seminar uh, in Central Texas. They're based in Houston. And at the time they only had a Houston and Dallas office. And once I went to that seminar, I actually went with my mother and um, I was like, wow, they actually shared some real tangible information rather than kind of a little bit. And then here, you know, buy this package to get the details. And so I convinced her to become members. So we became members and um, once I became a member, I got super excited and I quit my job at Papado and I was like, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I know it's going to be real estate and I'm going to make it happen. So I quit uh, a, a bit prematurely, but I did. And I was like, I'm going to make it happen. And I just hung around the office a ton. Uh, so much so I would categorize myself as in the annoying category. I was there all the time. And eventually they noticed I was there so much, they offered for me to become a real estate agent in their office to find investment deals for their clients and their member base. So I became a real estate agent specifically for investors. And this was in 2009. So this is right after the crash. So I, I didn't see the crash, but I saw the aftermath of it. And so I've kind of uh, seen from the recent bottom. And, um, and then I was an agent for many years, became a wholesaler to make more money. I eventually ended up uh, wholesaling a bunch to a local real estate company. They asked me to join their team, run their acquisition team. We had uh, up to nine guys. I think we closed uh, like 95 deals in one, uh, one year. Ended up uh, meeting Hillary along this timeline and um, proposed to her 
and eventually we decided to both quit our jobs. We got married and then she was also pregnant with our daughter coming up. And this was all in like a three month period. And at that point, uh, we decided to actually start investing, which in entailed acquiring our own properties. So from 2009 to January, 2016, uh, I was only an agent wholesaler. I hadn't done any investments. I had partnered on some deals and I had done some like flips and rentals and things with my parents and such, but I never acquired my own properties up until um, that 2016 timeframe. Yeah. So it's interesting that I, there's a lot of similarities that you and I actually share on there. I know you probably can't see it from here, but I've actually got like an entire Kiyosaki shelf, nothing but purple and black books you know, right there. And that's, that's what started when I was teaching. And I thought that was funny. And then I did go into a sales job as well. Um, one of the, one of the things I, I think is really interesting is that he said he started out working as an agent for investors. Like, so he went out, got his real estate license, right? Um, guys, all of us here have our real estate license. If you're watching this, you should, I mean, you've got your real estate license somewhere in here and he started working for investors, but he did it through um, Lifestyles Unlimited. For those of y'all that don't know, uh, it's kind of like a coaching program uh, that's, it, it's a pretty large company and they, they literally ho handhold you through the entire process, of course, for a fee, but for the most part, they, I mean, I've, I've run into those guys quite a bit and they're actually pretty legit. They will get you across that finish line, but in order to be an investor, you kind of have to have a little bit of jingle on the sideline. So a lot of people can't really start off that way. You know, you need your down payment money, rehab money and all that kind of stuff, or at least ways to, to procure it. Um, so when you were working as an agent, for investors, did, did all of your clientele come through that lifestyle funnel or were you able to secure some from outside of that? And if so, how did you do that? I'd say like 90 to 95% came through the member base. Uh, I did occasionally have maybe a family member or a situation where I did a listing or represented a buyer to acquire their property. But I actually didn't even want that work. I wanted the investment work. The only reason I became an agent was as a way to, because I had quit my job, I needed to make money, but I didn't want to leave the space of real estate. And particularly, I didn't want to go outside of investment. That's, that was like my goal from years before. And so I thought it was a, I thought it was a beautiful overlap. I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to leverage the experience of multiple, multiple deals of acquiring these investment properties through the lens of my client, the investor, and understanding how they perceived the deal themselves, how they ran their own due diligence, how they looked at, you know, rental comps or, you know, sale comparables and how they re viewed the rehab, how they dealt with hurdles that uh, uh, came about, fires, how they got their own financing. I <clears throat> was able to see how they put their own deals together to be able to acquire it but I had the front row seat through all of it. And through that, I exponentially quickened my learning curve. You know, it's funny you say that because again, the similarities are actually pretty funny. And, and, and as I look around, like, I feel like I'm kind of paying it forward a little bit too, because guys, if y'all are paying attention, he, he decided he wanted to be an investor. That, that same exact bug hit me. Um, it hit me in about 2005 while I was teaching. And I just really didn't have anybody to learn from it is to sit around it. And, and, but Marco found somebody, I found somebody, I found Eric, Marco found Lifestyles Unlimited. And then he moved on to a wholesaling company, right? Where we got to get into the little bit more of the, uh, the, the down and dirty part of investing, right? Really getting out there and, and learning how to find these deals. So when, when you went to go, was that a separate company or were you wholesaling for inside of Lifestyles? So Lifestyles didn't allow wholesaling. Gotcha. So I was strictly yeah. an agent and quick little quick caveat um, or quick tangent rather. Uh, when I quit my job to join Lifestyles during that little period there, I also, I was like quitting. I was going full into real estate. So I wasn't only relying on Lifestyles to determine my success. And at that point I wasn't an agent yet. I had just became a member. I had also enlisted the services of another person that was local here in San Antonio that was an investor that said, hey, I will teach you and I will mentor you if you pay me a fee of $10,000 for mentorship. So I was like, okay, I'll pay you, teach me. And so I paid the guy 10 grand and then a few months later he moved from San Antonio to Houston. So keep in mind, I was like 
22-ish, uh, 23, I don't know exactly, somewhere around there. And I had just quit my job and I paid 10 grand to this guy and basically that went away immediately. And I was still determined that, you know, despite what was going to go on, I wasn't going to go back to a job. I was going to make it happen. So, uh, yeah. See, I, I, I love I lo- that. <laughs> That's I love that part of the story. Now, guys, I want to point out something that he said that most of you might have overlooked. He was 22, 23 years old at the time, right? He didn't have a wife. He didn't have kids. I'm sure. I don't think, I don't know if you had a mortgage, you know, a lot of that overhead kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I always joke with my wife, you know, before we had kids and all that stuff, I was like, Hey, I've been poor before I can be poor again. I was like, if I want to go do something, I'm going to go learn how to go do it. And baptism by fire is a great way to do it. You know what I mean? And that's what Marco chose to do. Now at 22, 23 years old, uh, the pain that you inflict is mostly going to be on yourself. So, you know, and it's something that you can handle, right? I mean, if you got to eat ramen all the time, that was your choice. Um, so be careful. <laughs> I mean, don't, the, everybody that's like, oh, that's what Marco did. Uh, that's what he did when he was 22, right? So it was not enjoyable. There was a period where I, there was multiple times I had to sell like most of my furniture. Hillary talks all the time how I didn't have any furniture, Um, there was a period where I didn't own a microwave for two years because I couldn't afford it and uh, like I was in pretty bad shape I eventually had to go to my parents and say hey I need a little help can you give me a little bit of money to like make it so um, but even in the in that scenario I still didn't want to go get a job so that doesn't fit everybody and at the time yeah I was single so I didn't have a lot of responsibilities at the time Um, but you know if you have a particular desire or particular want you know figure out what sacrifices you're willing to make to go towards it and just keep pushing towards it and I think we're I think that's a common mistake that a lot of people make is whatever their goal is you know hey I want to get my first property or I want to get my first multi or I want to do my you know fifty thousand dollar wholesale or whatever the the expectation of time that they put on it <clears throat> is usually one that in, in induces high levels of stress, anxiety, frustration, envy of others. It puts them in a negative space. And rather than saying, hey, you know, I need to have this by this time, it's good to have some goals to be shooting towards. But instead, understand that you we're all relatively young and we all well in I don't know everybody listening, but we all have years in front of us generally. And we have a life in front of us. And too many of people are thinking, you know, I need to get this done by next year. Or I need to make this happen by, you know, whatever in, within three years, rather than thinking, hey, I'm going to be in this real estate game five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. It's okay if I don't necessarily hit these particular things right away, as long as I'm moving forward and building a strong foundation, because exponential growth can occur. And it's hard for us to understand that. But if you keep moving towards your towards your goal and you're moving in that positive direction, eventually you'll hit what you're trying to do. And then you'll find that you'll, things will be coming faster and faster and moving at exponential rates. Yeah. And I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I got it so funny because, I mean, you said you didn't have a microwave. And I, I don't know if I've told you this story, Marco, but there was literally a point where I was so broke. I, I knew my cell phone bill was due the next day. And I, I, I mean, nothing, not a nickel, do nickels to rub together. And I had to borrow $20 from my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, to go buy a t-shirt so I could go wait tables, uh, just so I could make enough money to pay that bill because I wanted to stay on the path that I was on. And it, it's a humbling thing, right? It, it, it's, uh, it kind of wakes you up. But what- That's how what you I, knew you were gonna marry her, huh? Oh, I, right then and there. I was like, all right, great. So now that I'm a- now that I've got, you know, a comma in my bank account, she's, I'm not worried about her running off with it just yet. Um, when I get to that second comma, we're going to start watching her a little closer. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, but what, what I want to also point out, so he went to go work for Lifestyles, guys, and, and so he could be around investors, so he could see what the investors were doing. And then he was working for a wholesaling company after that. Guy, every move that Marco made was, and then he said he was working for Cutco, doing calls, doing being a server, getting out there. Every move that he made, guys, it, it, it was putting himself in the path of learning. Like he, he's, he understands what he wanted to get, but he may or, I mean, all the books that you read on investing, which is a little frustrating to me, is, is they're very conceptual. You know, it's very like, well, this is how it works. And it's like, yeah, but I really need to take the engine apart. Like I want to see every single thing that works because it's a little nerve wracking and I'm, I'm a little bit more analytical than that. But, 
he's paying attention, he's doing what he does, and, he, and he's figuring out he's getting in the path of learning. Even to this day, um, owning the properties that I own, which I, it's nowhere near Marco's portfolio, I guarantee you, is like I, I try to live off of my agency income and I try to continuously reinvest my investment side of things. And guys, I think a lot of y'all, a lot of people I know that work for White Liner have a full-time job and do this on the weekends. So what I would suggest, guys, if you're out there doing agency work, save your money and pay attention to the investors that are around you and get in the path of learning from these guys. Uh, I know Jessica's on here. Jessica's in the path of learning from me and from Hillary and all that kind of stuff. She's around all the time trying to figure out exactly what's going on, trying to understand the numbers, see what's happening. And I know Jessica's, I mean, she's gotten really damn good at it. And I now Josie, which I think she's in earshot of Jessica's computer, is getting herself in the path of learning and trying to figure out what's going on so she can make those wise decisions. So my next question, Marco, because I told you I'd keep this to an hour and I, man, I could talk to you for days, is what happened? What, tell us about your first investment deal and when it was just you on that deed or a company or whatever it is. I'm assuming it was just you on the first one. So uh, none of it was ever just me. It's always been Hillary and I, but um, the first one that um, didn't that is love, ladies and gentlemen, any... love. Well, she's on here, so I got to make sure. I see, I see you. Got to make sure to say it right. Um, the first one that didn't, episode. yeah, the first one that didn't have any like partnership or any sort of um, where I was in control of it, I suppose, um, was when we in 2016 January. Actually, it was December 31st, 2015. We bought it. That was seven years after I initially started as a real estate agent getting into real estate. That was seven years of me doing transaction, transaction, hundreds of transactions at that point, but still in my mind, mentally telling myself that I didn't know how to get the money. I wouldn't be able to do the deal, you know, all these different things. What I realized in retrospect, uh, reflection on, on that time was I was the one stopping myself. I had all these mental hurdles, mainly around the money. Uh, I had all these mental hurdles telling myself why I couldn't do it. And uh, once Hillary and I got married, and especially once we found out we had our daughter coming, I basically told myself, uh, I don't, this is my number one focus. I don't care. This is, I'm going to make it happen. And um, the main thing I noticed that made a change in that was when I started shifting my conversations. I tell this to people all the time and it sounds very simple. A lot of people, it doesn't sync with them. Maybe it's not the right time for them to hear it. But literally when I did this shift is when things started changing. So prior to us getting that first property, my conversations always stemmed around the transactions. Like how can I close my next transaction? You know, if I was an agent, what are you looking for? How can you find, how can I find you a deal? You know, what area of town, you know, what kind of, terms on your contract or what kind of rehab whatever you know how how can I get them as a client if I was a wholesaler you know where are you buying at you know what type of deal are you looking for you know I talked to them about maybe the deal I have coming up or whatever but it was all about those all all about those transactions those deals where I was wearing an agent hat and I was wearing a wholesaler hat I was never having conversation wearing an investor hat because I told myself I couldn't be an investor just mentally Investor conversations are like, hey, if my problem is I need money, hey, Colin, would you partner with me on this deal? Do you have money? Have you ever considered uh, lending? You know, those type of things. I started telling everybody, instead of trying to get them to buy my next wholesale deal, I started talking to them about how can they lend me money on the next deal I find or how can they partner with me? And once I started doing that, of course, I got a lot of no's, a few maybes, and I got one yes. My one yes was actually a friend of mine from college days that had always known that I've been talking about real estate and seen me be in real estate. Now it's seven years at this point, but he had known me even prior to that, talking about investments and such. And, you know, I present, I just went up to him and I was like, hey man, if I can find a deal, would you want to partner with me? And I kept it at a partnership. I was like, hey, we could split it 50-50. I'll do everything. You don't have to do anything. And um, we'll split it 50-50. You just bring the money. And so the first deal we got was on the east side. It was actually off of Bundy. We, it was listed on MLS for 45000 
we got it contracted and we purchased it at 30,000. He lent us 43,000. Uh, we didn't use all those funds for rehab. We used most of it though. Uh, we did very, very light rehab. It was a three, one um, house and uh, we sold it owner finance. And then literally the worst case scenario happened. The, we sold it owner finance. So it was a wrap uh, mortgage. And the lady we put in there paid her payments for about a year, a little bit over a year. And then she stopped making payments. So we had to do a foreclosure on her. So literally the first one that we did, we had literally the worst case scenario, which is we sold it owner finance and we had to foreclose. And there was my first one with this guy. Uh, and I'm trying to prove concept with him and make sure he trusts me because I want to do it again. And I'm trying to convince myself that I can, you know, take on this responsibility and be a good steward of somebody's funds to be able to do it moving forward. But that's the beauty of being an investor. You make your money when you buy. So you want to put yourself in a position that even in your worst case scenarios, you come out ahead. So actually what happened is we just went through the foreclosure process and we took the property back and then we sold it to cash. We did like very light make ready. Uh, after we took it, took it back, we like did a little bit of paint and we like kind of nailed in some things. Uh, they stole the AC units and the stoves. So we put a new stove and new AC units. Um, and uh, then we sold it cash to an investor. So it had been about a year and a half at this point, about 18 months. So there was a little bit of appreciation, but not much. Uh, but we sold it cash to an investor, I think like 45, 48, something like that. So um, when you do all the calculations, uh, the guy that invested with me, we both made 10 grand profit each over 18, over 18 months. If you include the down payment that was paid, the um, payments they made for a year, all the interest from that, and then the profit between what we sold at cash to the second investor, or the, the investor in the back end. Uh, we made 10 grand each. So he made 10 grand in 18 months. So it, literally the worst case scenario, but he still profited. And I, I just told him this is part of how it works. Yeah, that, that's hysterical. Like, first of all, guys, I want you to notice <clears throat> one quick thing. Um, he, there were so many questions that he asked that I know he was probably terrified to ask, but he went ahead and did it, right? Question number one is, I don't know how many people you asked if they had money. I'm, I'm going to go with upwards of 50 you know, probably more than that, that you have to have money and one person said yes. The next thing that I think is really interesting in the story is he's, he's in the path of this, folks. He's, he's in the MLS all day long and he finds this property worth $45,000, right? Or asking forty five dollars for it, right? And he actually bought that house for a third off simply by asking, right? You write the offer up, you come in there, he got it for 30, I mean, that's 33% off, guys. I mean, for those of y'all quick at math. And then he turned around and owner financed that deal out. Um, that's an interesting one to do with a partner on that thing. I'm guessing they'll split the cash flow on that thing and held the deposit just in case, or how did that work out? Yeah. So when I just paid him half of every, any money I got. So when I got the down payment, I paid him half of it, every mortgage payment, the interest we had, a, obviously has an amortization schedule. We already knew what the interest was per payment. So every month we knew what his payment was. So I paid him half of that. And then just kept them up. And I, what I didn't do, and that I never do, Hillary and I never, Hillary and I never do, is when the property came back, I didn't go back to him for more money. I never go back to an investor for more money. So at that, we had already been making a little bit of profit from the past down payment thing. We we did we uh, fronted the uh, the repairs, but they weren't very much when we got it back. Yeah. Yeah, that's an awesome story. And then, you know, obviously foreclose on it, you bring the whole thing down. So you made your 10 grand. So for the first time, you made $10,000 literally out of nothing but sweat, it sounds like. Through investments. I had already done that through wholesaling. Well, but, it was, but on your own. I right. mean, because that came from that came from zero. I mean, you, you didn't have any money out of pocket really on the deal except for, I guess, a new AC and a... Right, and it improved concept. And then uh, we also realized that we don't ever want to do a want to do a partnership again so the partnership was great <laughs> there was nothing wrong about the partnership and it was exactly like i described it where we were in full control we did everything he was just the money guy he got half half of the profit in his money return however you, yeah 
however there was a lot of things that were unexpected like I wasn't expecting foreclosure and all this so I felt like I needed to run everything by him you know being a partner and, and also it was the first one those type of things so there was like a psychological kind of weight there and he was cool with everything he just followed my lead but moving forward Hillary and I were like we're not going to do it that way anymore we're going to do it where people are straight lenders and we're in full control and we make all executive decisions all the time and we'll, of course we'll communicate um but nobody has any power in decision making so gotcha so more like limited partners or i guess you wouldn't even call them partners you're just straight yeah. getting promissory notes from them you can still structure it that way partnership wise but we transition fully to lending plus in a lending scenario hillary and i can actually make more because we have full equity especially in a market that we've been in where it's appreciation um we capture all the appreciation and the appreciation so, real quick just to kind of unpack a little bit about what he said because i know we're kind of speaking in some weird language here when somebody's a true partner in something ladies and gentlemen like if, if he bought that house for 45 and sold it for 60 um that that fifteen thousand dollars everybody would get seven and a half right i mean if it was a flip for a simple thing right because that is an equity partner they get half of everything that goes down in the deal what he's saying now is that when he borrows money from people he simply just pays them an interest rate I'm going to pay you whatever interest rate, like you gave me $50,000. I'm going to pay you 10% a month. You get 500 bucks a month, period. So if I take that $45,000 house and turn it into a million dollar house, I get to keep all that profit. You got your $500. So that's kind of the big difference that he's talking about with the lesson that he learned and how he structured the deal and how he's making more money now, because I know Marco is a master at forcing equity uh, into property. So I know he's really, really good at that. And so um, we were just talking before we started recording about a seven plex that he's, you know, forced a lot of equity into. So um, that, that's kind of what he's talking about there about changing that. So let me, my next question to you is, and this is just my experience, and I'm pretty sure it's, I'm, I'm going to guess the same thing hit with you. Did you, were you able to continue that relationship with that lender? Yeah, he's still lending. He's in one of our other projects right now, our five plex. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, the big, I, I, when I was a teacher, I used to have this thing. I had a couple of rules in my classroom. The number one rule was no what if questions. I hated what if questions. I was not a science teacher because <laughs> if you ask a what if question, you can usually figure it out. But I do hear a lot. If I borrow money, what if something goes wrong? Well, guys, you should know enough about deals to make sure that when you buy, like Marco said, you made your money on the buy, even if the whole thing just goes up in flames you should still be able to get out of it relatively safe because um, you got to make your money on the buy. And I said, and then once you do that and once you communicate, well, I think 100% of problems are problems with communication. He communicated well, the guy knew what to expect, what was happening. And therefore he still, so that you said you did that in 2016. So five years later, y'all are still friends and we're still working together. Just change the structure a little bit. My next question is, have you gotten any referrals from money guys from that first money guy um from the first i've had people that he's referred yes uh, none of them have panned out for one reason or another um but i've but across all of our private money lenders we have a pretty decent amount of referrals yes that have yeah been. so if you take care of people ladies and gentlemen then you take care of that right so you're the word's gonna spread i, I think it's funny now because i keep a list of all of my potential lenders and current lenders and, and that list gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I feel like, every day. Um, and it's, it's really kind of fascinating and fun the way that works. Yes, to double down on what you're stating right now, that's absolutely true. See, what happens is in the early stages, you're thinking, like, at that time, I'm only thinking about that deal. Like, that's the huge accomplishment for me is getting one person. I don't – I'm get, I'm putting – $43,000 to work and none of that came from me and in my mind prior to that it was like how am I going to get the money <clears throat> so um yeah I was only focusing on that deal and just getting success and then like how can I get the next one right but again like I mentioned previously um thinking more long term is going to aid you and so now when I'm talking to these people I'm telling them I don't really care you know, if you get into the next deal or whatever, I'm going to keep talking to the next person. I'm going to be raising more money, whatever. My goal with you, Mr. Or Miss Potential Lender, is that once you give me money, 
you're going to be sticking with me for 5, 10, 20 years over and over. And quite honestly, hell, maybe when you pass on and you will your money to your children, I'm taking care of their money for them too. And I'm continuing to go on and on and on. That is how I'm trying to build a relationship with them. I want them to be thinking it's not just about one deal or the next deal. It's about a continuing relationship that if I do my part, this can be a very fruitful relationship and a win-win situation for both of us moving forward. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that, that's a little bit further down the road, but what he did is, is, is the old Warren Buffett thing. I think it was Warren Buffett that said, put all your eggs in one basket and mind it very carefully. What Marco did is he put all somebody else's eggs in that basket. His job was to watch the basket. Um, so big takeaways for me on this one, which uh, hopefully everybody else has taken away from is number one is Marco did this, his first deal with his name on it without any of his own money. It's very, very possible. However, guys, please do not think that you can do it just by running around asking people for money. You need to know the safeguards that Marco had put in place for his investors. Okay. He didn't just go, Hey man, can you write me a check for $43,000? I hope to see you later. Shook his hand and took off. That's not how it works. A lot of people think that's how it works. It's not really in the scope of this conversation to explain all the safeguards that Marco put in place. Um, but I know he did because he had spent the previous seven years, if I'm not, if I got my math right on this, um, learning and watching so hundreds of transactions go through that he knew how to protect his investor, how to protect himself and how to find those good deals. So guys, everybody heard, and I love hearing these stories because everybody hears, well, how do you invest with no money down? That's one example right there. Um, still made $10,000 after a year and a half, even though the whole thing went pretty gnarly, um, which is awesome, really. And then he still has that relationship later, which is beget more money, I'm sure. So um, I love that. So what did, just out of curiosity, what did you do with that $10,000? Where did you, how did you leverage into your next step? So that was 10,000 over 18 months. So really at that time, we were just trying mm -hmm. to make it. So that just went into surviving. Because keep in mind, we, uh, when we did this, we both quit our jobs. We had the kid coming. That was our first deal. And we needed to just, you know, keep the bills paid and keep moving forward. So what really led to our exponential growth was the ability to continue to do it. So to continue to acquire properties that we didn't put any money down, even to this day, we still have not put our own funds into it and um, then fix the properties and sell them or keep them or rent them or whatever we may be doing with them. That's been the whole key of it. Um, private money, I talk about it all the time. Too few people utilize it. I think there's a big stigma against or that holds people back from just having conversations about money. You know, it's, it's very awkward. It's uncomfortable. It feels like it's like a taboo subject, but honestly, it, it doesn't, you don't connect with everybody. Not everyone's going to lend to you, but the ones that you do connect with, it's like, you're like a saving grace to them. They, if they, you know, people have money, you know, one problem is trying to get money. But the people who have money, their problem is like making sure their money is like growing and is in a safe spot. Like that's like a big hassle headache in itself is like, hey, do I put it in the stock market? Do I buy this stock? What's going to happen with the stock? Like there's all kinds of stresses with that. So you're providing an actually very strong service to somebody if you can show them that you're going to be a good steward of their money because obviously they've acquired the funds through blood sweat and tears and whatever they've done to get tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars but if you can orchestrate a system to where you diligently buy conservatively and you manage the asset properly you can build returns with them they're going to love you and uh, that's what it's all about and quite honestly those early investors or lenders rather that we got a lot of them came through calling through my old agent lists like old clients of mine and some um people i was wholesaled properties to and what i found is as people aged yeah seven years ago they might have been buying properties but now they're seven years older and they're tired of dealing with tenants or they got burned so many times that now they don't they don't want to do that anymore. They want more of a passive scenario, which is what we provide. Or they have so much funds or they have so much going on, they want to diversify. 
you know, hey, they maybe they're doing owner finance or rentals or whatever, but they're not able to put their money to work fast enough or whatever, or they just want to have some funds that are working over here that doesn't require any of their attention because all their attention is on their main pipeline or whatever. Well, you just run into the normal people that just don't have time, energy, or money, or time, uh, energy, or the knowledge to be able to um, to do the transactions themselves, but they have the money, and then you obviously connect with those people. So I really transitioned from calling down the list as a wholesaler trying to get a property from a seller or calling down the list to these buyers trying to sell my next wholesale deal, which I was still doing that too and put more of my energy and attention and priority into calling down the list, just ask people if they'd be willing to work with me on a project. And the phrase that I use a lot is like, if I found the right deal with the right numbers, would you be willing to be a money partner with me? And I use the phrase money partner, which then later I describe as a lender. Um, but that's a phrase that most people can quickly understand in a simplistic way. I'm writing that down. I like that. So uh, what I, uh, sorry. If I find the right deal with the right numbers, would you be interested in being a money partner? Question mark, silence. Don't say anything. Even if it's <laughs> awkward, <laughs> yep. don't say anything. If it's, if it's, if there's a lingering silence, that's awkward. That's actually in your benefit. That means they're thinking about it. And if they're thinking about it, you're in the maybe camp. So Mar Marco touched on a lot of things and I, and I promised him I'd get him out of here at 1230 because he's got to go do something to go get ready to go on a trip. So what, what I wanted to say though is, is people that have a lot of money sitting on the sidelines, they understand the concept of the velocity of money. Money sitting in your bank account earning 0.01% does you absolutely no good. Money has got to be changing hands and working in order for you to continue making money. If nothing else, just keeping up with inflation in today's age, right? That money has got to be moving. They want to find somewhere to put it. If you know what you're doing as an investor, you can, you can show these people like, hey, I have a way to help you make money by having the entire thing real estate backed. It's like stocks are not guaranteed by anything, but real estate, you can have these things backed by real estate where they're, they're protected, not against all loss. It's not, a, it's not an infallible system by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a heck of a lot more secure than going out and buying the stocks or spending the money on the roulette table. So it is, people are interested in talking to you about it. You just need to make sure you know what you're talking about. So I think that's a great one. And then I just have one more question before I open or, up the questions to anybody. Or if you don't know everything, you have access to the knowledge somewhere. So you have calling, you can call, you have somebody else on your team, or you have, you have another investor you can reach out to, or maybe a title person or whatever. So the knowledge is, is within your reach. Right. And, and exactly. I, I wish I knew everything, but I don't. But I know where to find the answers to just about everything. Um, the, the next thing, I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but I'm willing to bet that the, the Romero family is with the number of holdings that y'all have. I, I'm just going to go ahead and say this are pretty close to being, if not already there, completely financially independent, where you could just take three months off and not have any work, but still have your rental income and all that stuff coming in. And I think what's interesting about that is what Marco said, and I, I wish I could say the same, that he's done that without any of his own money out of his pocket. And I think that is an intriguing thing. That, that, that is a goal for me. It's like, I'm tired of putting my own money into these things. How can I use other people's money to get me financially independent, to get them more wealthy, to give people good places to live? I mean, the whole situation right here is all just based on that beautiful brain inside all that hair. I love that. He's, he's made a huge difference for his family, for his investors, and for people, you know, in the greater San Antonio area. And I think that's really, really a cool story just because he took the time, he took the lumps, he had to eat a bunch of cold burritos because he didn't have a microwave, you know, while he was learning all this stuff. And it, it's, I, I love it. It's a great, great story. So before I let him go, we've got a couple of people. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask Marco um, about his deals? I, let's not try to get too technical because I don't want to you know, what forms did you use or all that stuff? I don't want to get into that, but does anybody have any questions they want to ask Marco before we take off? Dang, Marco, either you're really good or I'm really good. Uh, it's Marco, it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. I do, I do want to just add to what Marco was saying was that like right now, if y'all look at us, we're like 
we just started kind of taking off with it, there was a lot of sacrifice. A lot of like, uh, like probably five years, right? We're coming to the end of our sixth year doing this full time. So we're about to start our seventh. Um, for probably five of those years, it was really rough. It was a lot of credit card debt just to stay alive. It was a lot of worrying and not knowing if we were going to make it. So it looks easy, but it's, it's really just being consistent and, and doing it. But like, it was, it's not all easy. It's just really bad. There's been a lot of sacrifice made. I think that, I think like, that anybody does it knows that you know what I mean I think it's the people coming in that are like oh I want to do it it's going to be so easy we all know it's not you know yeah there's so many people saying oh I'm just going to get an Airbnb well first of all good luck getting that Airbnb because the market's crazy like you can't even buy a house right now so it is it's a lot of work and a big thing too is like I don't think Marco touched on this but it's really a lot of it too is like your partner your partner is going to make you or break you and if you don't have a supportive partner they don't have to be in real estate oh. like Colin. I know Amelia's not in real estate, but if she's supportive of you doing what you're doing, then like you'll be good. But if you have the wrong partner who doesn't see your vision or believe in it or fights you with that, that's going to be a problem. I yeah. couldn't agree with you more there. <laughs> Recently, I think I told y'all when we last went to dinner, I was working on a financial statement for a bank or lending. I can't remember what I was doing. And I realized that we had actually had over a million dollars in debt. Um, and it was all against property. I mean, it's good debt. And I was so excited about that personally. I was like, yeah. And I went and showed Amelia and she just went ghost white. You know, she's like, what? And uh, it, that, that was a long conversation uh, while I explained to her exactly what I was doing and why I chose to do it that way. But um, yes, having a supportive spouse is very important. And I might add that you might want to talk more frequently than I probably do with my wife. Um, I can't wait. She's actually, she's starting to chomp at the bits, come wanting to come work with me full time, um, which I'm, I'm really excited about. But we'll, you know, we'll get there when we, when, when it's the right time for us. So um, I, I love the story. And I, just one last question, Marco, was it worth not having a microwave for two years to end up where you're at right now? <laughs> um that's a dumb question. <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, I I definitely could have gone about it better. And like, for instance, I didn't have to quit my job so abruptly because I was so motivated, you know. But everybody, you can look back and you could have made, you know, obviously I could have not given that guy ten grand. That that wasn't the best idea. But um, you know what you what i've been trying to focus on lately is being more grateful for where i am in my stage of my journey and i think what is often too natural to feel especially when you're on social media and it's one of the reasons i chose to stop participating in social media so much as i used to is because the it can promote a lot of negative emotions. One of them would be, you know, looking to somebody who's posting their accomplishment and being envious of that or feeling inadequate yourself because you're not achieving at the level that you want to be achieving. And rather focusing more on understanding that, hey, you've come a long ways to get to where you are. There's been a lot of choices and hardships and sacrifices that you made probably even before you even entered the real estate realm that has led you to this point and just be appreciative of what knowledge you've gained because you know five years in I was probably complaining that I didn't have my own investment property but that five-year version of me versus my first month version first month version would have saw that as the most glorious success there is so just being understanding that hey it's a process keeping that long-term vision being grateful along the way and just keeping understanding that your little steps, even though they might seem inconsequential or they might not be where you want them to be, will ultimately lead you in the direction that you want to go if you're consistent with it. And you're, if you're willing to pay the long-term price, there's a lot of people that aren't willing to pay you know, the seven-year price to buy their first investment deal or whatever it may be for you. So just trying to keep that mentality of of um, long-term vision and gratefulness. I, I love everything you said. I, I love it because that's, that's it. I mean, it, it does, it hurts. It hurts sometimes and 
be grateful for where you're at and that you're still moving forward. So I love it. Well, Marco, thank you so much for your time. Uh, have fun this weekend. You're going to the coast, right? We are, yes. Yeah, go get you some vitamin D. Go get you, go get you some vitamin D. Stay COVID free out there. Totally. So thank you so much for your time, Marco. I really do appreciate it. And we got to go grab dinner sometime when y'all get back, when life gets back to normal. Are you a Texans fan? I got season tickets with Texans. You want to go? Sure, we can make it happen. <laughs> oh, it's fun. It's a great way to waste a Sunday. What, man? <laughs> Bye, guys. Thanks, Marco. Right. Super inspirational. Thank Bye, you. Marie. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. Bye.